Friends, welcome to such a time as this, where we will be connecting by video for the next while. We are acknowledging the need for social distance while also acknowledging our need to continue to come together, to gather around the light and to worship as the community of Trinity Grace United Church. As people called by the Spirit to journey together in faith, we need to stay connected and to ground ourselves in the practices of our faith, encountering God together through scripture, prayer, and reflection. The service today will be shorter than our usual Sunday mornings, more of a morning prayer format, and there unfortunately won't be any music for this service, but we are working on that for future weeks. Now, if you have worshiped with us in person before, you will know that we start by acknowledging that we gather on the traditional and unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples. We also begin by welcoming you as your full self, as God has made you beloved and blessed. We believe diversity is a gift from God and I'd love for you to let us know that you were here with us, gathering in this virtual and extended time. And I will let you know how you can do that at the end of the service. So welcome everyone. My name is Reverend Sandra Nixon. I am the coordinating minister here at Trinity Grace. And I hope that this time will speak to your heart and to your spirit. Let's take a moment now to center ourselves and bring our attention fully here, letting go of whatever we were just doing or what our day has been like so far. Take a breath in and then release fully and take one more breath. and release. Friends, Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, O God, through the darkness and storms. Grant us courage to await the dawning light. Friends, though we may be separate, we are called together by God's love. Though we might be isolated, we hold one another in prayer. Though the times may feel uncertain, even terrifying, we trust in God's presence and healing power. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One. You are our guide and hope in and through the Lenten wilderness and through the wilderness of this strange and difficult time in which we are living. We do not understand all the things that make us whole, but we know the ever-flowing love of Christ, like living water, courses through our lives and is available to us even in the wilderness. We immerse ourselves in this sacred flow, bind us to each other, all members of Christ's body, and so also to Christ, whom you sent to show us the way of love, leading to abundant life for all, and in whose name we pray. Amen. A reading from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, 
and with God is great power to redeem. It is the Holy One who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Let us pray our prayer of unburdening. Blessed are you, O God, our guide, our hope. For 40 days, Jesus went out into the wilderness, isolated from this world, facing his innermost fears and temptations. In this time of social distancing, we find ourselves on a similar path, and yet we are tempted to panic, to hoard, to grab what we can for ourselves. We long for reassurance that everything will be okay. We long for familiar routines and for the sense of control we felt just a few weeks ago. We are tempted to give in to fear and grief. Forgive us, O oh God, in the midst of our anxiety. Calm our fears. Draw us to your grace, your peace, your truth. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus, of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet, 
and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a smell because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the witness of our ancestors in faith. And we come to our reflection. This Saturday, I came over to the church to check on the building and to do some work in solitude. It's been a bit challenging to work efficiently at home with four of us stuffed into quite a small townhouse. The church was dark and eerily quiet. It made me realize that there is almost always someone here or something going on. And it's strange and it's unsettling. You know, people talk about moments, moments when life has changed. Maybe they've lost someone or a profound change has happened in their lives that also leads to an experience of loss. They talk about moments when something happens that makes the reality of a situation or the loss hit them yet again or makes it sink in that much more deeply into a new level of awareness. Well, that happened for me today as I walked into this empty, dark, silent church or church building, I should say. For we know the church is more than the building and thank God for that because while the church building gives us a place to physically gather, we can still gather in heart and mind, albeit virtually, but I digress. I want to dwell a bit on that feeling of having the reality of loss hit us at the gut level. Maybe we already knew it and understood what was happening up here, but it's different when we find ourselves face to face with it in a visceral way. In the Gospel reading from John today, I, I think we see this very thing happening to Jesus. After Lazarus falls ill, Mary and Martha send a message to Jesus to let him know that his beloved friend has fallen ill. And Jesus' response to his disciples when they bring him the message is, this illness does not lead to death, rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then we hear that although Jesus loves Martha and her sister and Lazarus, he stays where he is for two more days. So finally, two days later, and we know how long two days feels during a crisis, don't we, friends? And it must have felt like an eternity to Mary and Martha, Jesus finally makes his way with his disciples to the house of Mary and Martha, where Lazarus is. John then tells us that Martha heads out to meet Jesus on the path, and then goes and tells her sister, and then Mary rushes out as well to go and meet Jesus, along with a number of friends who'd 
been at the house consoling and supporting the sisters. Mary rushes to Jesus and breaks down at his feet, weeping. And then all of a sudden, everyone else who's standing around is crying as well. And John tells us, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And we hear Jesus began to weep. Now, according to this passage, according to John, Jesus already knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus and even knew that Lazarus's illness was so that in Jesus, or at least Paul's words, the Son of God may be glorified through it. And we're told Jesus knew Lazarus would die, waited two days anyway, then tells his disciples they're going to see them to see him telling them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus in this story seems to have a very clear understanding up here of what's going on. And he, sees, he seems perfectly rational and calm about the whole thing until, until he comes face to face with Mary and her overwhelming grief, and the grief of the community. And then it hits the moment, the moment when we're not experiencing things up here, but down in our gut, and with it, all the emotions. And Jesus weeps. Even though he knows what's coming, he weeps. Just as we hear and feel the grief and lament of those mourning Lazarus, we also hear this morning the psalmist today expressing their grief and lament. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. I've been thinking about lament today, this week, and its role in helping us process and move through grief. Even before I realized what the readings for the week were, a lament or a lamentation is a passionate expression of grief. Often through music, poetry, laments can also be expressed verbally, sometimes in a very intense way through wailing or moaning or crying. Many of the oldest and most lasting poems in human history have been laments, including in the Bible many of the Psalms as well as the Book of Lamentations. These laments that come to us from Scripture are often a cry of need in a, in a context of crisis, very often uh, Israel's crises. But even more simply, they are an appeal for divine help in distress. During this time, during our time, as we struggle to live with the reality of a world wrestling with a global pandemic, we are all experiencing loss and grief of many kinds on many levels. Maybe it's the loss of your regular routines or not seeing friends and loved ones. Maybe it's not getting the hugs that you're used to, not being able to visit someone who is sick. Maybe it's having a scheduled surgery postponed or missing other health appointments that contribute to your quality of life. Maybe it's losing your sense of security not knowing if you'll be able to find the groceries you need. Maybe you've lost your job or have lost contracts if you're self-employed. Maybe you're a healthcare worker and have seen people sick and afraid. Maybe you work at the grocery store or the bank and now fear coming to work. Maybe you sense the world's pain and feel others' isolation and have an acute awareness of how we are all being challenged and changed by this experience and that things won't ever be the same again. And maybe it's some or all of these on different days or all on the same day. And of course, many of us are seeking distractions in order to deal with our grief and ease our pain. 
And sometimes some form of distraction can be helpful because otherwise it would just all be too overwhelming in that moment. And we also want to do something uh, to help feel more in control, to help make it better, to help fix the situation. And often like now, there are things we can do. Help a neighbor, call a friend, speak up more for supports for the most vulnerable in our society. But friends, there also needs to be time for lament, to allow time to acknowledge our grief, our pain, to sit with it, and to find ways to express it or let the wave move through us. And sometimes we have to do this before we can get to the action stuff or even the hope stuff. I realize as I worked with this text this week, that's where I am. I am here. I need to lament. Have you noticed I haven't talked about the rest of the story? This week I've been watching the case numbers and death tolls continue to rise around the world. I received the news that a dear friend of someone in our congregation has died from the virus. I know folks who are out of work because of it, worried about paying rent and bills. I have spoken to homeless folks who are having a hard time finding meal programs that were open or a place to use the washroom or have a shower. And yesterday I found out a friend has just been diagnosed with cancer just as their spouse is about to go back to work at their school next week to help guide their staff in uh, reconnecting and trying to normalize things for their students who are also suffering right now. Friends, I am not ready to move to the end of this story yet. And maybe you aren't either, and that's okay. I can and will remind myself and you that the story does go on, that love is a part of it, that giving of ourselves and courage are a part of it, and that new and transformed life will and does come out of it. This I know here, here, but for now, I must lament. I must wait in that place, in that space, trusting that God is with me, is with you, and holding on to me and you in the depths and in the wilderness as surely now as when our alleluias will rise and our hugs will be in person once again. Amen. And now let us pray as we offer the prayers of the people. God, you are our refuge and our strength, a proven help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth may change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. O oh God, we pray that you would calm our fears. Give us focus on what is important. There is comfort knowing that you have walked this way before. And in the social distancing, we come to understand how we are all so intimately connected. Be with us, quell our anxiety and fears as we seek the best for one another. In this time of COVID-19, we pray for those who work in our supply chains, who are taking risks for us every day to make sure we have food and essential services. We pray for the frontline healthcare workers we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are the most vulnerable and that our actions may always be to protect those who need it most. We pray also for the world, for those countries overwhelmed by the virus and for those other situations of conflict, oppression and suffering that do not stop because the world is fighting a new threat. And we pray for those we know who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. And you are invited to offer your own prayers now.
God, as we journey through these unknown times, help us to seek to be the best for one another. Help us to walk in love and remain connected, knowing that you are with us. This we ask in the name of the one who offers us life and calls us to make our lives a holy offering of love and service. Amen. We continue with the disciples' prayer. Please say this along with me if you wish, in the words I use or your own words. Loving God, Father and Mother of us all, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, before we finish, I want to offer a few reminders for you. First of all, although the church building, including the church office, are closed, you can reach us by phone, email or on Facebook. Don Marie and uh, our office administrator and myself are working just mostly from home right now. Secondly, if you'd like to make an offering or donation, you can do that online through Canada Helps. There's a link on our website and we'll also post a link in our church Facebook page. Thirdly, we want to connect with you more as much as we can right now. If you're on Facebook, please keep checking uh, the three pages that we have. We have one for Trinity Grace Church, one for Gracie's Thrift Shop, and one for Graceful Noise Coffee House. We also have community groups that are attached to those pages, and you are welcome to join the group, which will allow you to post and see messages much more easily. Uh, we also have uh, been making some improvements to our website and wanted to let you know that we are going to be resurrecting, if you will, our blog page on the website. That's where we'll be posting news, reflections, uh, the text of my weekly message, and the weekly online worship service, uh, and other videos and things as they're produced. So if you are uh, not on Facebook, try looking at the blog page on the website for news, um, but we'll also be posting all of that through Facebook as well. Also, if you haven't already, you can sign up to be on our mailing list. Uh, again, there's a link through our website to sign up, uh, or just send us a note or leave us a message by phone and we will add your email address to our mailing list. Finally, if you have any announcements, things you want us to know about or let others know about, send them to us and we'll make sure that we get those out as well. While we extinguish this candle, we affirm that the light of Christ can never be put out. Friends, thank you for being here. As you go into the rest of your day and evening, may God's love enfold you, Christ's strength uphold you, and the Spirit's power move through you in acts of service and love. May God's love and grace be with us all, and may Christ's peace be with you all. <laughs>